1 Samuel chapter 29, David and his mighty men of valor have been away to war, been away to, to battle, and the Lord worked it out uh, that they didn't have to fight against Israel. And they're coming home from the battle. The journey has been long and tiresome. And we see what they discover in chapter 30. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinonim, or however you say her name, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. Now look with me, if you will, down verse 18. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that... Uh, they had taken to them, David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. And David came to the two hundred men which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him, and when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff, they shall part alike. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the good singing. I'm thankful you're faithful and true. Lord, I'm thankful for the blood of Christ. I'm thankful, Lord, that... I'm not the man I used to be because of the change that was wrought in me because of Calvary. Now, Lord, as we come this evening, we pray you'd bless those that are working with the children on the other side. Bless those young minds that are impressionable. May they find the Word of God uh, is precious to their little hearts, and may they hide it deep into their heart. That Lord, when they reach the age of accountability, they trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. Those that uh, have reached it and have not been saved, I pray you'd save them. Those that have been saved, may you grow them in the faith that, Lord, they'd understand uh, the truths of the Bible and the importance thereof. Father, I pray for those working with the teens. You'd bless their efforts. Uh, Lord, you know uh, the pressure these teens are facing in this day and age. Uh, they're facing far more things than we did when I was their age. And, Father, I pray you'd put a hedge about them. And, God, you'd undergird them. And, God... 
You'd help them while they're back there to learn and glean from the things of God. That, Lord, when the wiles of the devil come against them, uh, 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 they'd have the shield of faith to quench uh, all those fiery darts. Uh, and, Father, I pray you'd be with them. Now, Father, uh, us here in the sanctuary, meet with us, help us, uh, enlighten our minds, uh, strengthen us this evening, uh, 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 help us to hide the Word of God in our hearts that we might not sit against Thee. Uh, Give us something that will help us in the days of head uh, uh, to live for Christ and to make a difference in this wicked world. Uh, use this unworthy vessel. Uh, help us tonight. Uh, Father, certainly if there be any unsaved, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. Uh, Father, I pray for that struggling one. You'd strengthen them. Uh, and God, I pray you'd get glory to your name. Uh, help us this night. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen and amen. 1 Samuel chapter 30 is a very interesting chapter. It contains violence. It contains, uh, contains vexation and victory. I'm interested in the 200 that are mentioned in this text. Now, we could spend time talking about the city Ziklag being burned. We can spend time about the, the men being so vexed that their families have been carried away that they want to pick up stones and stone David, the very uh, 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 king that they have followed and forsaken all for. Uh, uh, we can uh, focus on the fact that David encourages himself in the Lord. And sometimes, friend, uh, 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 you don't have a church service to run to. Uh, sometimes you don't have a church family you can rally around. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, when all hell is coming against you, all you can do is find you a little spot, uh, spend some time with the Lord, and let Him encourage your soul. You can't encourage yourself in the Lord. But I'm interested in this 200. Look at verse 9. The Bible says, So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. Now, in verse 10, we find out how many is left behind. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. You find Besor mentioned again in verse 21. This brook Besor means be cheerful. Now these 200 that could not go on ahead with David find themselves at a brook. Now I want you to kind of put yourself in their mindset. These men are woeful. They are grieving. They've just come from a long campaign. They've come from a, a, a battlefield. They've come, uh, and all their heart's desire is set upon uh, 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 seeing their wives, seeing their children, uh, laying in their own bed instead of out under some tree somewhere, uh, 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 eating a good home-cooked meal. They come, the city's burning. None of that's going to happen. And they're grieving for their wife and children or their wives and children. Uh-uh. They're upset and grieving. They don't know what's happening. They're woeful. Can I say they're not only woeful, they're worried. They did not have the Geneva Convention that have certain rules to battle, which it amazes me America tries to follow and uh, many other nations don't. They don't have any assurance that their wives and children are safe. They're worried about it. Matter of fact, it's amazing they didn't kill them. Most of the time, and we don't like to think this because when we come in church, we hear, you know, Joel Osteen saying all the time, every day's Friday, nothing bad ever happens. Obviously, he's never watched the evening news. But in those days, when they'd come and overthrow a city or overthrow a town, uh, uh, they do a uh, very unseemly thing to the women and, uh, and the children. Uh, and then they would uh, torture them and then they would slay them. And these men are grateful to know their children haven't been slain and their wives haven't been slain, but they don't know what's going on wherever they got carried away to. We see they're grieving, they're woeful. We see they're worried. 
but they're also wearied. The reason they didn't cross over Brother Bob Bezor is because they couldn't. It did not come for a lack of want to, Brother Brian. These were warriors. These weren't little sissy prissy guys. These men were warriors. They're used to being in the battle, Brother Clint. They're not used to being on the sideline. They're used to taking care of business. They're used to doing the things in the name of God and in the name of uh, uh, their King David. And here, they're just slap war out. They don't have the strength to cross over and go on. Can you imagine knowing your women, and your wives and your children are in jeopardy and you don't have the strength to go and try and recover them? Can you imagine the mental anguish? And here, David leaves them at Besor, which every little trickle in the brook is saying to them, be cheerful. I'm glad God knows where to lead us, that even in our worst hours, He can remind us to look to Him and find hope. But these men, they're worn out weary and not able I remember several years ago we had a preacher come through and this guy was wild I mean he's all over it and somebody made the comment said, I remember when brother Doug used to preach like that brother Doug's got old huh man there was a time I used to jump on pews and jump over things and run and have myself a spell so what happened that song Brother Bob wrote, Age Got a Hold of Me. Uh, it's not for lack of want to. There's things you can't do when you get old. Well, these fellows are stuck by this brook because they can't go any farther. Now look at verse 24. I want you to look. David is speaking, he says, For who will hearken unto this matter? But as his part that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. They were left by the brook Besor, but they weren't left without responsibility. They were left with the stuff that might be needed on down at the battlefield. No doubt, there was food there. There might have been protective clothing there. We don't know what time of year it is, uh, but I'm sure they took uh, 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 clothing they may need if winter came on. Uh, 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 we also uh, uh, know that they probably had uh, spare armament there. Uh, they might have had more arrows, uh, more spears, uh, more bows, uh, 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 more swords. Uh, 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 they had to keep a fresh supply for those down at the battle. Again, they're, they're away from home. But they tarried by the stuff. And I was thinking this week about these 200. Wanting to go, but can't go. They're at this place where God's trying to cheer them up. And I got to think about that phrase, tarrying by the stuff. And I want to preach on this little thought for just a minute on some stuff to live by. Some stuff to live by. But Jim, we don't know how long they were there. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how long David was gone. We don't know. Could have been days. Could have been months. Could have been a year. We don't know. All I know is that 200 couldn't go to battle, but they could stay by the stuff. They found in that stuff there's something to live by. We not only don't know, Brother Jack, how long they're there, we don't know if they get any kind of word how the battle's going. You know, it's not like today where you can put, pull up CNN or Fox News and find out uh, all the false news and fake news of the day. They didn't get enlisted. David sent a messenger, which I doubt he did because he's already down 200 men. He's not going to spare another one. Go back there and let them know what's going on. We don't know if they got any word how the battle's going. 
yet they stayed by the stuff. And can I say, uh, 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 there may come a point in your Christian life uh, where you're faced with things you never dreamed you'd be faced with, uh, 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 where you uh, have a desire to do something for God, but uh, 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 you're just failing but physically and you can't do what you'd like to do. Uh, 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 you may not get a word from heaven, I remind you. Uh, uh, Job never got a word from God while he was going through his trials. Uh, you may not... Uh, uh, get any reassurance from heaven uh, but there are some things you can live by uh, uh, that will make a difference when it's all said and done and you'll be glad you stuck by the stuff uh, so I got to thinking about some stuff we can live by can I say first of all you can live by the word of God brother Cody uh, quoted it the other night the Bible says in Matthew 4 4 but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God uh, you know the story uh, 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 Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness uh, Jesus has been there fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, by the way, that's always when the devil shows up when you're at your weakest point. Uh, uh, and Jesus is there, uh, hasn't eaten anything. Uh, and the devil begins to tempt him with bread, uh, with some food. Uh, I, I will tell you something. Uh, uh, when you're hungry, uh, you can be tempted with something physical. Uh, but Jesus, being the darling Son of God, said, Man will not live by bread alone, uh, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hey, yes, you need physical food, uh, but you need spiritual food, uh, and you will not survive this Christian race uh, uh, leading on your own understanding. Uh, uh, you need something fresh from God. Uh, you need some help from God. Uh, and I promise you, if you live uh, uh, your life surrounded by the Bible and putting the Bible in you, uh, there will not be a trial overtake you. Uh, there will not be a temptation overtake you uh, there'll not be anything else overtake you that you won't be equipped for uh, say preacher I'm weak uh, Paul said when I'm weak then am I strong because you cannot depend on your own strength you've got to depend on the strength of the Lord can I say something there's something about this Bible that'll help you you can look at the phenomenon of the Bible it'll help you look at all the miracles uh, why do you think God recorded the miracles that he did so you can gain strength from it I mean uh, uh, hallelujah for the parting of the Red Sea hallelujah for the three Hebrews that went into the fiery furnace and come out not even the hair on them was singed thank goodness for uh, 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 the, the story of Daniel in the lion's den where God sent an angel and shut the lion's mouths uh, hey what a blessing about uh, the miracles when Christ walked on earth uh, when he opened blinded eyes when he touched the, uh, the lame and made them walk uh, uh, when he raised the dead uh, hey what about all the miracles God recorded in the Bible why did he do so so we can go gain strength because the Bible says, says he's no respecter of persons. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He changeth not. Uh, and if God could do it then, God can do it now. You can live on that. There's never a place you'll find yourself that you've gone too far. God can't help you. Mm -mm. You can live on the Psalms. I try to read psal some Psalms throughout the week. Psalms are uplifting. Huh? I told y'all I quit watching the news last year. Somebody said something about you know, Miss uh, uh, Brittany told me about the volcano the other night. I don't know. Uh, uh, Miss Tammy told me uh, uh, this morning they pushed back the tax deadline. I didn't know that either. I don't know none of it. Because really, I found myself so involved in all that was going on uh, uh, around the election and all the things that were coming it was bogging me down it was causing my spirit to become depressed I just got where I took news from the glory world business picked up in my life I don't know much what's going on in the world and you know what that's a blessing I got tired of looking at King Andy tell me what I couldn't do uh, so I got to hear and find out nothing's impossible with God and he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the good pleasure of the hey what a blessing to get the news from the glory world the psalms will uplift my spirit 
How did David encourage himself in the Lord? Who do you think wrote most of the Psalms? He just got over down the hillside just like he was back there tending his father's sheep and just started singing to the Lord. Uh, God inhabits the praise of his people. You start singing praise unto God, he'll show up, I promise you. The Psalms will help you. I thought about this. Uh, all the promises of the Word of God will help you. Uh, he's never broken one. I got news for you. Titus tells us it's impossible for him to lie. If he promised it, he's either already done it or he's going to do it. Uh, how about the promise he's coming? That'll help you down the road. That'll give you a little strength, a little fuel in your tank. Thank God for those promises. So I'm telling you, you can live by the Word of God. It'll help you in this crazy, messed up world. And it is a crazy, messed up world. I was thinking this week, do you realize that if you take away New York City, Chicago, Illinois, Los Angeles, the rest of the country thinks like we think. In my travels, everywhere I go, people are scratching their heads saying, what are they talking about? That's not how we think. All this woke stuff and cancel culture stuff and all this junk, where's all that come out of? Chicago, New York City, and L.A. comes out of the pits of hell, but it's propagated in those liberal cities. Can I help you some? 85% of America is not liberal. We're not. But you start listening to all that, you start watching all that is on TV and all that, it'll, it'll bog you down. But you can live by the Word of God. Uh, you'll find one of these days the Lord's going to cancel the devil. Uh, one of these days he's going to wake up in the lake of fire. Now I'm getting some strength from all that. You can live by the Word of God. It's stuff you can live by, huh? I thought about this. You can live by the weapons of spiritual warfare. Make no mistake. The Lord's coming soon. And the devil knows that. So he's pulling out all the stops that he can to attack God's people, to discourage God's people, to make you feel like a second-class citizen where you can have no victory, where you can have no joy, where you can have... Why? Because the devil knows the joy of the Lord's your strength. And so he wants to rob you of everything God wants to help you with so you cannot impact anybody else. Can I say, most Christians do not live in wicked sin. You listen to a lot of preachers, they talk like Christians are so wicked. Brother Brian, most Christians aren't wicked. We're just wore out. The devil is wearing us out day in and day out. Makes you feel like you're ineffective. You can't make a difference in anybody's uh, life. And the Lord says, hogwash, uh, you are the light of the world. You are making an impact. You are making a difference. Uh, but you're in a spiritual battle. Hmm. Listen, the battle lines have been drawn. And we're the grunt soldiers on, on the front line. And let me help you something. If you do not use the weapons of spiritual warfare that God has afforded you, you're going to get messed up. You're going to lose parts of you. Well, what are the weapons of warfare? Well, Paul pinned them down for us pretty good in Ephesians 6. Verse 13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. But Tony, what a lot of people are doing, they're trying to fight the spiritual battle with part of the armor on, part of it not. You're not going to you're not going to be able to be effective if you're only wearing part of the armor. It's just not going to happen. You got to take on the whole armor of God. Well, what is that? Well, the Bible says that uh, uh, wherefore take up on, unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. God doesn't want us to fight. He does the fighting. He just wants us to stand. And when everything else is coming against us, just keep standing. Hmm? Uh, you know what the world sees? They see everything coming against you and you still standing. They, they gain admiration for what you're standing for. 
Has anybody ever been to uh, Arlington National Cemetery and watched the changing of the guard? I want to tell you something. There's something spiritual about that. Those men counted the highest armor or highest honor to take that post and to stand and guard the tomb of the unknown soldier. Can I say they give up certain things to take that post? In order to be one of those men, they agree to not drink alcohol for their six months' stay to doing that. More than that, they take and use a military man. They take an oath not to cuss, say any cuss words. The whole time they have that commission. They sacrifice some things of the flesh in order to fulfill that high honor. And then they agree to stand their post. There have been hurricanes blow through Washington, D.C. And they've told them men, men, you, you don't have to take your post tonight. It's too dangerous. They say, oh, no. And they go out there and they walk those steps. They click those heels. They uh, investigate the weapon of the one taking their post. And they go through that same, same ritual every 30 minutes regardless of the weather. They stand and take their post. You know why it's a, such a thing to see? Because of what they stand for. Mm. Can I say, there's a greater battle. It's the battle for man's soul. And Jesus has paid the price for it. And all he's asked us to do is, every day, stand and take our post. And take every shot that the devil can throw at us and just keep standing. But you won't be able to without the weaponry of the Lord. Well, what is this whole ar armor? Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. You will not be able to stand unless you've donned the truth. Truth, my dear friend, will set you free. Why do you think there's so many false Bibles? Because they want to keep people in darkness. The truth will set you free. But you will not be able to stand unless you're standing with truth. goes on to say, put on the breastplate of righteousness. It takes truth and righteousness. Can I help you with something? It's always right to do right. When you're dawning truth and righteousness, you'll not fall prey to the devil's tactics. I guarantee you every time that you've messed up in your life, it's because you've laid truth aside or righteousness aside. He goes on to say this, verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Can I say from the head to your toe you have a piece of armor that will cause you to be able to live no matter what you are facing. And it goes on with your feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace you ought to always be ready to give an answer for why you're standing you ought to always be ready to share the gospel with some sinner who needs to hear that jesus saves jesus saves can i say this he goes on to say above all taking the shield of faith mm, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked everything that the devil throws at you can be quenched by faith matter of fact the writer of Hebrews tells us that without faith it's impossible to please God. Faith is something you have to stand with. You know what those men did by the brook of Besor? They had faith in what David came back and told them that he inquired of the Lord. The Lord said, we're going to recover all. They sat there every day waiting for their wives and children to come back. They had faith. Hmm? Listen, I don't, I don't know a whole lot. Don't have a lot of faith in a lot of things going on in this world. But I do have faith Jesus is coming back for us. I got faith. Hmm? And I say this. He goes on to say this. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The helmet of salvation put on your head. You know why he gave us a helmet for our head? So, because you take a lot of blows. But more than that, the devil always attacks us in our minds. 
And so you need to put on that helmet of salvation, remind, remind yourself who you are, who you belong to. And remind yourself the devil's a liar. And again, take the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Our weapon, our offensive weapon, is the Word of God. If you go and study when Jesus was tempted by the devil, three times the devil tempted him, and all three times the Lord said, and it is written. You know what's in the devil turning and go find somebody else to pick on? The Word of God. Hmm? So you can live in this world, no matter how weary, no matter how worried, no matter how you know, wore out and woeful you become, there are stuff you can live by, and one of them is the weapons that fight against spiritual warfare. We're in a battle. We're in a battle. It's not time to hold hands and sing kumbaya. We're not living in the sweet by and by. We're living in the nasty now and now. And we are in a battle. Paul wrote to young Timothy, Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are in a battlefield, friend. Uh, I got good news. I've read the back of the book. We win. But between now and then, how you conduct yourself in the battle depends on what you live by. You live by the Word of God. Live by the weapons of spiritual warfare. Can I say this? There's stuff you can live by. Another thing is a walk that pleases God. Hmm? Any child of God, been saved, washed in the blood of Christ, knows what it is to be redeemed, ought to have a desire to please the Father. Now, we may fall short of that from time to time, but it ought to always be our desire to please him. We got Brother Charlie. I'm glad he didn't have to work this weekend. Brother Charlie's here. He's got three precious youngins. He's Charlie four. He's got Charlie five. Got Mateo. Got Joseph. I watched Charlie five. He wants to be just like you. He wants to please you. They all want to. Joseph, he's his own little deal. You know Joseph. He's the troublemaker, huh? Uh, I love him. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a blessing. I love Joseph. I don't get to spend enough time around Mateo. She's so quiet. But I watch Charlie. Charlie wants to be like Dad. He does. Most little boys do want to be like their dads. Most little girls want to be like their mamas. Hmm? Can I say this? As a child of God, you ought to have something inherent in you Makes you want to be like him, want to please him. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about our walk. Let me give you some verses in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. I want to tell you Christians that get jacked up, they live by what they see. I want to tell you something. You get to looking around, you get in trouble. You know where you need to look? The Bible says looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You've got to look above the rudiments of this world if you're going to get some help, but you've got to learn to walk by faith. Sometimes it's not going to make sense. you just got to step out there on faith anyway. Hmm? I love uh, the Indiana Jones movies. The second one, not so much. But I like, uh, the first one was one of my all-time favorite movies, except the snake part. I hated that part. First time I saw that was in the theater. One of them snakes, I pulled my feet up in the seat, man. I'm thinking, Lord, have mercy. No snakes. Why do they have to be snakes, huh? Uh, but in the one when Sean Connery, his dad, was in it, and they was looking for the Holy Grail. By the way, let me just help you. Let me just give you a little history lesson. The reason America was able to win World War II because Hitler was crazy. He really was. I believe he was demon-possessed. They said that, that socially he, he, was a, he was a speck on the wall. He, he didn't talk to people. He was you know, very withdrawn. But yet when he would stand before the masses, there would be a spirit come over him, and he would give out to orders and a charge, and he would rally their nation. I believe he was possessed. But he was certainly obsessed with obtaining religious artifacts. He believed if he could find the Ark of the Covenant that his army wouldn't be defeated because he, you know, studied under some psycho-religious guy who wanted the, the Aryan race, a supreme race, and 
He knew just enough about the Scriptures to make him dangerous, and he said, if you could get that Ark of the Covenant, you'll never be defeated. Hitler, so obsessed with obtaining some of these uh, so-called religious artifacts, there was an Ark of the Covenant. There was not a spear of Nancy's. There's nobody ever kept a spear that was thrust in the Savior's side. And there's certainly no evidence that there's ever been a cup that he drank out of uh, uh, there at the Last Supper. As a matter of fact, he said he wouldn't drink uh, until they came into the, uh, uh, the New Kingdom. He wouldn't drink with them. But people uh, think there's this holy cup you can drink out of and obtain eternal life. There is a fountain. You get one drink of living water, you'll live forever. Amen. All right? But let me help you something. Hitler, was, he spread out his troops. He's uh, got troops in Europe. He's headed toward Russia. He had troops over in Africa. And the troops in Africa were looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Douglas MacArthur was able to sp uh, split his uh, supply lines there. He was able to defeat him there. And uh, uh, he ran out of gas going to Russia. And because we could break his supply lines, that's the only reason we beat, we beat Hitler. He had a far more superior army than anybody else on planet earth. Uh, I'm reminded if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, and that didn't cost you anything extra, a little history lesson. But Indiana Jones was based on some factual things, although there was no cowboy with a whip that went around doing all the stuff he did. But in that last movie, when he's looking for the Holy Grail, he gets to a point he's got to cross this great divide to get over to this little cave where the, the grails were, the, the cups were. And he's trying to remember the story and the things that his dad had taught him about that. And he realized that you had to be pure, and, and the only way you can be pure is by faith. And he, he, he can't see any way over there, and he just takes a step. Boom! And a pillar catches him. And he takes another step, and another step. And could I say, in reality, that's how we are to walk as Christians. When we can see no way, he makes a way. Just keep taking a step. I love that song that Miss Rodka sings. Uh, just keep taking steps. Walk by faith. If the Lord has given you direction, just walk, in, walk towards him until you run into him. It'll be all right. We're to walk by faith. Uh, Galatians 5, 6. Uh, uh, this I say then, walk in the Spirit. Ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, Ephesians 5, 2. Uh, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself uh, for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for our sweet-smelling savor. Uh, verse 8 of Ephesians 5. Uh, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. We're to walk in faith. We're to walk in the Spirit. Uh, we're to walk in love. Wouldn't this world be better if everybody just walked in love? Uh, 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 we're uh, uh, to walk in love. We're to walk in the light. Uh, uh, Colossians 1.10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, uh, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, we ought to walk uh, worthy of the Lord. In other words, uh, we can't earn our, uh, our, our salvation, but, but we ought to walk like we could earn it, my dear friends. Uh, 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 we find uh, Colossians 2.6, uh, As ye therefore received uh, 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 Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Uh, and 1 John 1.6, 1, uh, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Uh, but if we walk in the light, uh, as He's in the light, uh, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. The Bible teaches us how to walk. Uh, we ought to live by some stuff, and one of those things is a walk that pleases God. Don't worry about what men think. Worry about what God thinks. I tell all these preachers, of course I'm old now, I can pretty much say and do what I want. A lot of these fellas... Some of these preachers we have come in and preach for us like Brother Daniel. Every week he's in a different church. He has to be real reserved that he doesn't tick off the preacher and say something that the preacher don't like because, you know, that's going to affect his ministry. You know, you tick off enough preachers, you're going to be sitting at home at the house, not somewhere preaching meetings. And you don't know this. All you do is come to Emmanuel Baptist Church and you worship and you serve here. But talk to Big Doug. He'll tell you a little bit about it. There are preachers in this world that are crazy. And there's something that you don't know anything about. There are, there's politics in the ministry. How many of you like politics? 
Well, there's politics in the ministry. And depending on what college they went to to get their education, or depending on who they studied under, and who uh, there are cliques in the ministry. And there's this lame brain that believes this thing. And this lame brain believes, I mean, there's preachers who believe you, you can't preach unless you're wearing a white shirt. There are preachers that believe all kinds of crazy things that are not in the Bible. Well, people that make their living by preaching, like Brother Daniel, who's on the road every week, he can't go in and preach against white shirts if somebody uh, doesn't preach that. Or you know, all these things. They, gotta, they, they just have to constantly be on guard that they don't offend people. Now, Paul said, uh, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. And Paul said that uh, uh, and when he was with the Greeks, he became a Greek. When he was with the Romans, he became a Roman. Uh, but by all means, he might, might win some. But me, I don't have to be any of that. I just mean me. And I really don't care if the brethren get ticked off at me or not because i got a, a few little folks that love to come hear me preach every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and I really don't care about what everybody thinks. I care about what the Bible says. A lot of times I go to these meetings and I upset some of the apple carts and really don't care. They can get right or they can get mad. I really don't care. But see, a lot of these fellows, they have to worry about all that stuff. What we ought to be concerned about is what God thinks and not what all these little Baptist popes think. Because I really, I don't care. I don't care. I don't, I don't care. There's some of them, if you hang out with so-and-so, I can't be your friend. Well, go on down the road. I got enough friends. I don't need you. Huh? Really, I don't care. I'm not being crassed. You know, I'd like to get along with everybody, and I'd like to be kind, and I always, I'm always kind. I always try to be a gentleman and all those kind of things. But there's some of these guys, they're crippled too high for crutches, and I really don't care about what they think. I'm more interested in what Jesus thinks. And I've been told, you know, you can't have this friend or that friend. We're going down the road. Because I've got a, a, a certain philosophy I've lived my life by if, one, if, if you're my friend you'll always be my friend I, I, I don't care what comes in your life and what you face and what what comes in, I'm still going to be a friend that's just the way I am I, I don't believe in being two faced my friendship with you is based on you know uh, what the Lord's done in our lives it's not based on uh, 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 you continually pleasing me I just care about you. I'm your friend. And uh, I believe we would restore a whole lot more people if we just have a, a love for them, be a friend to them. I can't be a lot of things, but I can be a friend. I'm glad I got a friend that sticks closer to a brother. I'm glad he hadn't kicked me out over some of the dumb things I've done through. Are you listening? Let me give you one more thing you can live by. I'm talking about stuff you can live by, stuff that no matter what comes, it'll help you, and it'll cause you to be cheerful in the midst of your trouble. One more thing. I find that you can live by a willfulness to trust God completely. Too many wishy-washy people. One day they're for Jesus, the next day they're not. One day they believe this, another day they're not. One day they're in, next day they're out. Just, make, just become stubborn in this light. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to trust Jesus no matter what happens. I'm just going to trust him. Uh, he's faithful and true. They sang that a minute ago. Jesus will never let you down. Well, I want to hang out with him. He's never going to let me down. And I've just got a willful spirit about me to the fact that I'm just going to trust Jesus completely. A lot of people don't understand that. Preacher, how are we going to do this? Don't know. If God led us this far, He's not going. To, he's not going. To, you know, turn His back on us now. Uh, I'm just going to trust Him. Hmm? He's He's taken good care of me for 47 years. I'm not going to turn my back on it now. Hmm? Daniel chapter three, verse 17. You know the story of the three Hebrews that went to the fiery furnace. Well, the king said, "Well, I'm going to give you another chance. If you bow down and worship the image I made, then it'll be well with you." Well, this is what they said, verse 17. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. He said, uh, if he wants to, he'll deliver us from the furnace. By the way, he's delivering us from you. You're not going to have rule and bondage over us. Hmm? Verse 18, he says, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, 
that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which, which thou hast set up. You just need to have a willfulness where you're going to trust God regardless. Hmm? Uh, say, preacher, what are you going to do if they say you've got to quit preaching the Bible? I'm going to trust God. Let God be true to every man and liar. I'm going to fear God, not man. Hmm? It's better to serve God than mammon. Preacher, what are you going to do if they say you've got to start marrying, marrying homosexuals? That's not going to happen. I'll go to jail. Our jail ministry has been shut down because of COVID. Well, it's about time to start one up. We'll start one of them from the inside out. Are you listening? It's not going to happen. I'm just going to trust God. Uh, now, Brother Mike, I know, I know lame brain preacher. I've, I've kind of got on, but I've, I've known lame brain preachers say, well, God, it's not God's will. He'll never allow you to go to jail. Well, tell that to Peter, Paul, James, John. You know, they all went to jail. Uh, hmm? I'm just going to trust him. He's in control. Uh, I read this too over there in 2 Timothy 1 2. Paul said this For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I'm not ashamed. For I know in whom I believed, and am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I'm just going to be stubborn enough to just believe God's able to take care of me. Always has. Always will. Let me say this, and I'll be finished. Tarrying by the stuff caused the 200 to experience it. First of all, they recovered their wives and children. Verse 19, you'll find they got they got it all. They got their children and their wives back. Hmm? Some of you got wayward family members, maybe wayward children. You're never going to recover them unless you learn to tarry by the stuff. Can I say, secondly, those 200, by tarrying by the stuff, they were recognized by the king. Look at verse 21. And David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Now listen, your name may never ever be in lights. But if you stay by the stuff, and you live by the stuff when Jesus comes, he's going to salute you, friend. I'd rather have his recognition. I'd rather have his well done, thou good and faithful servant, than all the applause and all the praise of men. He was recognized by the king. And can I say something else about this 200? They tarried by the stuff, and they were rewarded by the king. Verse 24, they got the same reward as those that went down and fought the battle. You see, Brother, Brother Bob, when David was anointed king, God told Samuel, don't look on his stature, don't look on his countenance, for God doesn't see as man sees, God looks on the heart. Your willingness to fight it speaks a whole lot to God. And by you just living by the stuff, even though you might not have been the big name preacher that preached the big revival somewhere and many people came to Christ, by you being faithful, you'll have the same reward as they had. Are you listening? Your name don't have to be in lights. You don't have to be somebody in men's acclaim in order to be recognized and rewarded by God. All you got to do is be faithful. He honors faithfulness. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the one who gives a water to the man of God gets a prophet's reward. Hmm? That's a pretty good deal. They don't, have to, they don't have to labor and get the mind of God. They don't have to stand up and preach. They don't have to deal with all the issues that they got to deal with. All they got to do is get a cup of water. They get the same reward. What a, what a deal. Now, y'all going to fight, Brother Tony? Get me water now, aren't you? Uh, that's why I always love about Brother Pete. If you didn't know Brother Pete, Brother Pete was all crippled up in his hands and his feet, had arthritis in his lungs. Brother Pete came to our church because his hands were enclosed like this. He could use his thumbs, but that was it. But when he'd shake your hand, he couldn't open his hand, so he'd put his hand in your hand and shake your hand. 
the church he came from, they made fun of him because he couldn't shake hands like other people. And somebody invited him to our church. He showed up at our church. Now, Pete wasn't a perfect man, but he just wanted to do something. Two things Pete Fry did. He got the preacher to water. If a visiting preacher come, he'd remember next time that guy came if he wanted ice or no ice. He never forgot that. And every time you come, that water would be there. Even when Brother Pete would have a doctor's appointment, when we had Wednesday morning services, he'd schedule his appointment to where it would happen after he could come and get the preacher's water. He'd show up, get me my water, and then leave and go to his doctor's appointment. Hmm? He got the preachers the water. And he loved going out and passing out tracks. He'd hang them tracks on the door. You'd tell Brother Pete, do this street. You'd go to pick him up, he's five streets over. Man, he didn't care. He just hit every, he, did, he didn't know streets, he didn't know stopping points, he just kept going and passing out tracks. I believe he's got a prophet's reward waiting on him. Not because of his abilities or inabilities, but because he was faithful. He wanted to get the gospel out. He wanted to make sure the preacher had his water. What a blessing. You may never, ever be able to stand on a platform and sing like Daniel Waters. You may never be called to preach. You may never be given the gift to teach. There might be a lot of things you can't do, but one thing you can do is you can be faithful. And if you learn to live by these four simple things, neighbor, just wait you see what Jesus has got waiting for you. You know what you'll say? It's been worth it! It's been worth it. It's been worth it. I wonder, how are you living tonight? Are you tearing by the stuff? Are there some things you've just learned that you're going to make a part of your life regardless? If not, I highly would recommend it. Maybe here tonight you don't know Christ. And you don't know what life's about. There's nothing like having the peace of God in your soul. I'm not worried about a thing that's going on in this world because I know the one who rules it all. And I, would again, have read the back of the book. We win. It'll be all right. Hmm? I wonder tonight, do you know the Lord? If so, are you living for him? Are you faithful? Are you doing all you can for his name? Friend, because when it's all said and done, that's the only thing that matters. Right. Being by your be sore, learning to be cheerful, and just tearing by this stuff. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. Folks are already coming and praying. Maybe tonight you just need to come do business with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we're thankful. You gave us the word of God, the absolute final authority of our lives, to instruct us. Lord, I'm glad you recorded 1 Samuel 30. Lord, there's so much we can glean out of that chapter. God, I'm glad your earthly David saluted them men and rewarded them men. And Lord, one of these days our heavenly David is coming. And he's going to salute and reward those that just tarried by the stuff. Father, do a work in our hearts tonight. Help us this night to purpose in our heart. We're going to just live for Christ. Lord, it's not popular. The world certainly don't like it. And the devil fights it. But again, we can draw so much strength from you that we can overcome those things. Lord, if there's somebody here tonight not saved, I pray that, Lord, they'd come and trust Christ. Let us take a Bible and show them how to be saved. Lord, if there's somebody here tonight that's saved, but Lord, they've just gotten weary and worried and haven't found their be sore, I pray tonight you'd give them that direction for their life. Lord, just do a work. And Father, we'll thank you for it. For it's in the wonderful and lovely name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, Thanks for listening.